Hey all, I hope you've had a fantastic week. With its second installment in the series, The Coalition made Gears 5 their own, with refined graphics, new open world sections, revamped AI, and more. In our lengthy interview, the Vancouver, Canada-based studio shares how they delivered best-in-class effects and achieved some of the highest fidelity character models seen in-game, all while achieving 4K 60fps on the Xbox One X. In addition to the interview, we've included their visual technology of Gears 5 presentation from Unreal Dev Days. Recently, Microsoft held its biggest inside Xbox event yet, and many Unreal Engine powered games were featured center stage at the annual show. There were newly announced games from Microsoft Studios, Obsidian Entertainment, and Rare, along with release date reveals for highly anticipated titles that include Ninja Theory's Bleeding Edge and Mojang's Minecraft Dungeons. To celebrate, we've compiled a list of fantastic titles that took center stage, coupled with their official trailers and descriptions. See them all! Unreal Engine 424 Preview 3 is now available. Download it today to get the latest fixes and try out new features, including landscape tools, hair and fur features, updated material layers, and many more. Visit the 424 Preview forum thread for a full list of updates and share your feedback on this and subsequent releases. Remember that preview builds are not production ready, so we encourage you to make a copy of your project for testing. Now over to our community rock stars who are jumping in Answer Hub and problem solving with other developers. Thanks to Every Nun, Lord Stuff, D Demon, Blue Mind Studio, Clockwork Ocean, Churer, Thompson N13, Kreman, Subdevs, and Casio Pantoja. Thank you all so very much. And on over to our community spotlights, jump into the ultimate toy sandbox and build the train set of your dreams with Tracks, the family-friendly open world train set game. Create colorful railway systems, decorate beautiful towns, transport commuting passengers, and even ride your own train in first person. Check out the game on Steam. Fight for the high ground in Gun and Buckler, a multiplayer action game where you, a frog, Either fight for rewards or cooperate to escape the clutches of the frog fighting industry. Game features laser guns and reflective laser shields. Follow their progress on Hamar Game Collective's website. With aesthetics inspired by older generations of comics and flash games, Starglades is a 2.5D platformer that you can demo now. Download their game from our forums and give Zenrock Studios your feedback. Thanks for tuning in for this week's news and community spotlight. Hey everyone and welcome to the Unreal Engine livestream. I'm your host Victor Broden and with me today I have a whole slew of smart people that are going to talk about some very interesting topics. Uh, first off, our principal mathematician David Hill. Uh, welcome to the stream. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we also have a senior VFX artist, Bill Cladis, on the stream, and our technical art director for VFX, Wyatt Johnson. Hello. Thanks all for taking the time. Sure. Coming here to share your knowledge on a topic that to some uh, can be a little bit foreign and perhaps uh, intimidating. Um, how yes. did how did this come to be? Um, I, I think I could start by yeah. saying, David and I. So I did a GDC talk about two or three years ago, and it was aimed at effects artists. Actually, a very similar premise of, hey, let's you know try to be a little better at math and not be so afraid of it, and realize how we can build our own tools to be a little smarter and do, you know, it was like how to solve really large scale problems. And I don't even know how you and I got introduced, but mm -hmm. I, I asked like a simple, like, it was something about like vector squared or something like that, and like how to notate it or something. And David, instead of just like sending me a message and just going on his way, he like actually came to my desk with this huge thing of notes <laughs> and was like, so this is this. And he's explaining, I was just like, wow, what, an, like, what a generous person, you know, to, to be able to do that. So immediately, you know, I, I used him as a resource to be able to just proof my presentation in a few other areas. And afterwards, you and I were thinking, I was like, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's gold for artists mm -hmm. internally, externally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is something that we should teach. And then I think you should take it from here because you were the one that put us together and we all kind of went to have lunch one day. Yeah, I think Wyas was talking about similar things. So. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get us all together to talk about these concepts and see where everybody was and what kind of information we could we could deliver that would be really useful. Um, 
I yeah. guess that was a little while ago. So we yeah, had a that chance was last year. Internally within uh, Epic, we've given a few courses to the different artists where um, we showed them some of the same material we'll show today, although this is a slightly different version of it. Um, yeah. And the idea was just to help level up people as our tools are getting more sophisticated, they're getting more mathematical, and it just helps to know some of that language so that you can express yourself as fully as possible with them. Yeah, and, and uh, I think it's important to express that this isn't a math class, it's an intuition class, <laughs> is the <laughs> way I think about it, which is, yeah, I don't think anybody has to come away from this conversation with any concrete piece of knowledge about any of the topics. To me, it's more of like, oh, I heard that term once. And then you start to, oh, they talked a little bit about a dot product, and then you start to, like, we'll show some visuals, and maybe you'll start to equate some of these terms with a visual thing, and then those, the little synapses will start to fuse. Um, and really, it's just about intuition. And, and oh, over my career, it's been lots of tiny little aha moments rather than a, I'm going to think about math for two weeks and then get smarter. Like, that's not how this stuff works. It's always like, oh, I have a little problem to solve. So I'm going to find a piece of intuition that I don't have, and maybe somebody like David will help us get over the hump, or we'll do a little, we'll go deconstruct one of the content examples, or mm -hmm. we'll go look at the math hall, which is this amazing resource we have. And you start to just nudge your knowledge and intuition forward a little bit, and then maybe when you're thinking about a different problem, you'll have that little spark like, oh, I, aha, I know how I could maybe take that idea of comparing two vectors and I could apply it to characters, or you know what I mean? So that I think intuition generator is a b better way to think of this than like a math seminar if that mm -hmm. makes sense yeah, yeah. That, i think that sums it up pretty well yeah um i think whenever you're ready we can get started okay yeah should yeah. we pop up the this stuff why do you have right now just this yeah um so basically we just wanted to start with something moving and some context for the first part of the conversation uh, and this is a little simple scene. The, the point of none of any of these examples is not visual fidelity. It's more of just expressing a, a subject. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that we were kind of solving here is how do you make something bounce? And we're not going to go into all the different pieces of what it takes to do a collision system. That would be outside of the scope of this conversation. But just thinking about what does it mean for something to bounce off something else or collide with something, there are a bunch of t topics that kind of fall out of that that are really fundamental, rudimentary math topics uh, uh, that might guide people to some intuition. Uh, the first and most obvious one are these arrows here in the scene. And these are vectors, which are basically directions. Uh, and fundamentally, in order to make something bounce off something else, you compare these directions to each other. And when certain criteria is met, maybe you flip a piece of them or you do a little work to, you know, invert the direction you were traveling. And so, um, you know, th this scene basically shows some balls flying around. This is their velocity, and their velocity is a vector, and David's going to talk about vectors if you need some intuition about that. And then the scene is full. I've just scattered a little sparse version of them, but the scene, every little thing that could possibly be collided with has these vectors that are facing off of them, which we refer to as the surface normals. And so we're comparing the velocity vector of these balls to the surface normal vectors of this world. And when we do that comparison through some actually shockingly simple math, you come out the other end with a ball that bounces. And so this is kind of where we wanted to start the conversation because it expresses a bunch of interesting things. And then this also will tie as we go forward, we'll tie into actually a whole bunch of the other things we might talk about later, like <coughs> distance fields and gradients. And there's like there's a lot of stuff buried in this little scene, so we figured this would be a good way to start the conversation. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, oh, sure. All right. Uh, how do I flip over to the? Uh, probably all. Just go lower left. Yeah. You can do that. All right. Great. So um, I've got a few, probably the most thrilling form of media presentation, some <laughs> slides. <laughs> 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 um, but you know, the idea is I just want to um, highlight some mathematical concepts. For some of you, they may be um, things you know, so it's refreshing your memory a little bit. For others, it may be some new stuff. And then for you, it's more of a, um, an introduction. So it's not too deep, but um, we're going to talk about vectors for a little bit. You saw the vectors that Wyeth was just showing on those balls. So what is a vector? Well, the best way to think about a vector is it's um, we 
generally draw it as a little arrow, but what it really means is it's a direction and a magnitude. Now, it doesn't have an origin associated with it in the sense that this vector lives at this place, this vector lives at another place. That's additional assignment we can make if we feel like it. But vectors themselves, these four little green arrows on the screen, these are all equivalent. They all have the same length, and they're all pointing in the same direction, even though I've drawn them in different places. Um, so if we want to compare vectors, because um, their location in space is really kind of arbitrary, actually what we do is, is we'll take two vectors, like this ball and this little boy who's running. So the ball has the orange arrow, the little boy has red one, and we put them tail to tail, and then we can compare the angle between them. So the best way to, comp or the simplest way to compare them is something called a dot product. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. I want to talk a little bit more just about other things we can do with vectors first. So this is um, more of the refresher standpoint of how to picture vector addition. So that there are different things we do with vectors. We can add them, we subtract them, uh, we can transform them. But let's just talk about adding them for a minute because that's sort of the, the basic mechanic. So here I want to add vector A and vector B. Well, the way I'd like you to picture adding them is you move the tail of one of them to the head of the other. So I'm going to move the tail of B to the head of A. And now I'll draw a, a, a new vector that goes from their common vertex out to this new tip. And that's going to be the vector A plus B. Now, if I have a vector written out in mathematical form, is three different components. Uh, that could be X component, Y component, Z component if it's in space, or it could be colors. But if I'm going to add them, what I just did graphically is identical to just adding them component-wise. So adding them algebraically is very easy, but it's nice to have the geometric concept in your mind of uh, attaching one vector to the other, so head to tail like that. Now subtraction is just about the same as addition. We can have a geometric form of it. There are two different ways you can fuse subtraction. The first is I'm going to draw an arrow from the one I'm subtracting to the one who's doing the subtraction. So from in this case, it's A minus B. I'll draw an arrow from B to A. And I'll relocate him to the origin this way. And that's the direction for the guy who's the difference between A and B. But as you know, with just regular mathematics, like one um, minus 3 is the same thing as 1 plus minus 3. So I could do something similar. I could say, I'll just add negative b to a. And that should be the same thing as a minus b. And I can use my addition trick of draw and um, go from head to tail, where negative b is the original vector b, but flipped go in the other direction. And the way we subtract them algebraically, super simple. It's just like the way we add them. We just do it component-wise. But it has this nice sort of geometric um, representation. So I know I was going to show a little bit more with reflection vectors here. Yeah. So uh, if we're working in 3D, go back to this guy. If we're working in 3D, uh, we're going to use a dot product to give us uh, a comparison between vectors. And David will get into the dot products. But um, as a more simple kind of visual exercise, thinking about this problem, why don't we just constrain it to two dimensions? Um, and if we do that, some things kind of simplify a little bit, and then we can start to gain a little bit better intuition. Um, let me turn this down. There we go. So what's happening here? I've got my ball incoming, and this is the velocity vector. Um, it's not really uh, what I did is kind of normalize it just to so that it makes it easier to compare them to this normal. N normally, this would be kind of the length of how fast it's moving would be associated with this. But for now, just for ease of comparison, I've just simplified the problem and said, this is the direction that the ball is coming into the surface. And then we have this surface normal. So this is the direction that's sticking out of this surface. Um, and so the goal is, well, this is going to come in. It's basically going to mirror around this little center point, and I'm going to bounce off the other direction. So in two dimensions, what do we do? What kind of work are we doing here to figure out what this is? Um, so kind of behind the scenes here, I've hidden a little bit of a visualization of kind of how you could start to think about these vectors. And this is, this is really simple stuff, but actually this little concept here 
can start to unlock some important things when you're thinking about vectors. Because just as David showed a minute ago, the, these are components, right? They're like in 3D, you have, I'm pointing a little bit in X and a little bit in Y and a little bit in Z, and that combination gives me a direction in that space. So keep that in your mind when you think of vectors, is it isn't just this kind of monolithic idea of that way. Instead, you should always be thinking of vectors as, well, I'm a little bit over here, a little bit over here, and a little bit up, and to those three things combine to get me to a direction. So what does that look like in 2D? Well, oh, it looks like here's how much downward I'm facing of this incoming vector. And again, vectors don't have a position, so I'm able to transpose this over here to think about the problem. And this vector is the equivalent to this one. Okay. So let's think about this direction here. This is how much of the z direction of, that this arrow is in. Right? And this is how much of the x direction that this arrow is in. And the combination of these two guys makes my overall direction. In two dimensions, this problem is really easy because I can say, well, I have a surface normal that's facing the other direction. How much of that normal is facing towards or away from how much of my vector is facing towards or away? So I've got this is how much of my incoming vector is on x, and this is how much of my comparison is on x. Turns out they're equal, which makes the problem really easy. I just flip this guy. So now I've said, I have just exactly the same amount of me in Z, but now I have the negative amount of me in X, right? So I've done a little mental gymnastics to compare to what I was coming from, and then I've said, well, I, I see how much of me is facing in the appropriate direction to kind of bounce off of. This is a very simple version of this problem, but I think it starts to unlock some stuff for people to think about vectors as components, and that's like an important way to start thinking about this concept. Uh, and then this is just a visualization of that in action with varying random directions. And really all I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I'm comparing myself to this normal. Once I reach this plane, and actually the dot product is cool because it would actually tell me when I reached this plane, and there's some other interesting things that fall out of that that, that David will talk about and we'll talk about more later. But when that criteria is met, we just say, well, however much of my vector was going along this axis, flip it, and here I go. And the same is true if this little arrow was down here. That would now be on world Z. And I would do the exact same thing where I come off this guy. How much of me is in world Z? Let me flip that much. And so hopefully that starts to give you a little bit of an intuition for thinking about vectors as these components of a larger space and not just one idea of an arrow pointing somewhere. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. It's <laughs> a good visualization. Yeah. yeah. All right, how do I get back to the? There we go. Great. All right. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So that example was really cool. One of the things that made um, that example really straightforward was the fact that the wall and the ground were aligned either with the XY plane or, um, or, or they were either horizontal or vertical. And there it was easy to say, how much of my vector is going straight at this wall? That's um, the part that's headed in the X direction. And I want to flip that speed so it's headed away from the wall at exactly the same speed that it was going towards it, uh, but maintaining the up or down speed that it had that was parallel to the wall. So then there's a the question of what happens if my wall uh, is not aligned horizontally or vertically, where the components of the vectors um, are a little bit, aren't, um, where the components of the vectors naturally are in terms of x, y, and z, but I, I want to flip a component that's perpendicular to a wall that's at a funny angle. What does that mean? So this is just meant to generalize what Wyeth was showing. And it's using a dot product. And uh, um, the idea is we're going to show you how to reflect around an arbitrary wall. So I'm going to start off by saying the wall has, um, I have something that's a normalized vector. I've got a, a unit vector. It's a unit normal from the wall. And I'll have some velocity. In this case, the unit normal and the velocity is my vector v. But let's look at the little triangle that's v on the left-hand side of your screen. A dot product is something that's great if I take the dot product of a vector with some arbitrary direction. So you tell me that your little n, that's just a direction. It's got unit length. Then the length of that triangle down below is v dot n. So that's what I want you to understand behind for right now about a dot product, is that 
if I give you a direction in terms of a unit vector, I can ask the question with another vector, how much of this other vector points in that direction? And it will give me a number back, and that number will be related to how, how much of my original vector points that way. So that's useful. I've got my original vector. What I really want to do is I want to flip a component of it. So the first thing I want to know is how much of, how much of my vector is headed towards this wall, for instance, that's defined by this normal. So if we look over on the, um, the little triangle I've drawn over on the right-hand side, I've taken my original normal vector, my little red vector n, and now I've scaled him by the amount that v points in that direction. So now it makes the entire um, base of this triangle. So I've scaled up my initial normal vector, so he's now as long as um, the side of that triangle. Now we can do something cool. We can say, what happens to my vector v if I subtract that new vector? Well, now I'll get a vector that just points straight up. What I've done is I've taken away the component of the vector that was pointing in the normal direction. And I can go even further. I can say, um, what happens if I want to reflect? I can take that vector away one more time, and now it's going to be pointing in the other direction. It's kind of like um, if you have 5 and you want minus 5, you could either just put a minus sign in front of it, or you could subtract 10 from that, and then you'd end up with minus 5. So I've taken my original vector, and I want to flip a component of it. So I'm going to find that component, I'm going to subtract it twice, and that flips that component so it'll point in the other direction. So this is one of the really powerful things with the dot product. Now there are lots of other things we can do with it, and I'm not, um, but I think this is probably enough for right now. I encourage you to learn a lot about it. It ends up being a bread and butter of all sorts of tricks in computer graphics. Yeah, it's one of like the three big things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you were going to pick three, you're like, okay, this is one of the real meat and potatoes ideas. Yeah, yeah. This, you know, you'll get a lot of mileage out of dot products. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. So this is meant yeah. to be a teaser. So when you see this, you'll say later, like, oh, yeah, dot products were pretty cool. They did this thing. It turns out we do almost everything with them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Bill was going to show you a little bit more with yeah. just like reflection vectors so and having fun with them. Let me load up my example here. So. In case any of you watching are getting a little overwhelmed, I think just a, a very quick breakdown, you know, a dot product is just comparing two vectors, how similar they are, and if those vectors, the, the length is just the value of one, it's just, you know, 1.50, right? You can think of it like that, and it goes from one to negative one. So the basic concept is, you know, we're just comparing those uh, values, uh, or the, comparing those angles. And to talk about reflection vectors, just like with why I talked about and David talked about on their slides, just think about, you know, you're throwing a tennis ball on the ground. Which way is the tennis ball going to bounce right after it goes, uh, it contacts the surface? So an example I wanted to put together is something with mirrors. Um, I think this is a really cool example visually, and it just also reinforces the idea of reflection vectors. And this is great because it's unlike my contrived example where everything's beautifully axis aligned. This is reliant on the dot product, giving you the arbitrary walls facing arbitrary directions. Yep. And this is doing exactly the same as the simple example, but now it's the, the general case. This is the, the proof is in the pudding here that this works, basically, mm -hmm. is this example. Yeah, and, and what's actually really important, too, uh, and I want to stress this, and we stressed this when we did our talks uh, internally here, is that like you don't have to do all this math shorthand. right? We have functions mm -hmm. everywhere in Blueprints, in the Material Editor, and I really like that. As long as you understand what, what it does and what data to put into it, you know, it's useful, right? Let the computer yeah. do the work for you. So I've got a little transmitter that's transmitting a laser. It's really tricky to, there we go, to click on. So what it's doing is it's um, tracing uh, from its origin uh, against a vector. And we'll actually talk about transforms here shortly because it's related to this example. But we're just going to keep it simple to say that it's just shooting a laser uh, on a vector forward, so like 2,000 units or 1,000 units on x. And once we collide, we get a hit result. So we can see that we're scaling the laser. But I only want to be able to isolate it to different surfaces. So in the blueprint, I made sure to check and say, if I hit a mirror, now I can turn on the other mirror's laser and then calculate the reflection vector. So as I turn it here, you can see that it's spawning a new one. And then it'll just keep going to infinity up until <laughs> it uh, traces to itself, which I just had to tell it to stop because uh, it was causing problems. <laughs> but as you can see, this is a reflection vector uh, in a real world example. Um, being shown in the editor. And it's just, this is all done on the CPU in a blueprint, I'm just on a tank function, right? And there's... Uh, uh, Super we, fun. Yeah, we can, we can go into the, to the meat and potatoes of it later, but all we're really doing is we trace, we get that break, uh, that hit result, which is going to give us things like where did the trace end in world space, 
what was the surface normal of the hit result. So then I can start doing things like, uh, here was my directional vector that I was that I was going along with my laser, and this was the surface normal vector that I hit, and then return the reflection vector, and then I can transform that to spawn a new one. So uh, that's really it. Just kind of fun to watch, and we'll go ahead and release <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun uh, example. We'll release this to the public too, so you guys can play around and learn with this uh, if you'd like at home. So that's it for me. That's awesome. So no infinity lasers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. All right, I did All this right. pretty quick, <laughs> so I saw I saw the problem happen. I was like, I could make this go to infinity, but I'm just going to tell it to stop if it yeah. reflects back to itself <laughs> to make this a little easier. All right, well, I was going to talk very briefly about transforms because there's something that come up uh, quite often, and in this case, what I'm going to I have a little, little basically a little cartoon there on the left hand side. I've got some initial vector a, and I have um, a matrix capital M, and that's my transform. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means to transform it. And usually when we do transform, we can transform vectors in lots of ways. Sometimes we stretch them out. Sometimes we scale them. We can scale and stretch and rotate them. But the thing we do most often is we'll just um, transform them from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. And usually these coordinate systems are um, orthogonal coordinate systems, like x and y at right angles to each other. And that's sort of our bread and butter is I'll have a vector that's expressed in terms of one local basis, one little x, y, and z, and I want to talk about that in terms of another um, local basis. I need to translate from one to another. So when I have a vector, as Wyeth mentioned earlier, I really have, in this case, it's two components. It's a little 2D vector. How far do I go in x? How far do I go in y? And I've drawn these with these funny little green lines here. Now, my new basis, my other coordinate system, I'm going to just pretend as a rotated version of the first one. So the new x-axis is down a few degrees, and the new y-axis is rotated over a few degrees as well. And when I'm transforming a vector, all I'm really asking to do is to, um, in this case, I want to just re-express it, my original vector, in terms of this new set coordinate system. So that means there'll be, it'll be how much in the new x-axis do I go, and how much in the new y-axis <coughs> do I go. Uh, so here. Originally, it was a little bit of y and a lot of x, and now it's a little more balanced. With my new coordinate system, if I wanted to talk about this vector a, I'll say that it's about you know, one unit of x and one unit of y. Uh, let me copy it over to this other side of the page. So it looks like that. And I'll go ahead and rotate this back so the coordinate system is um, aligned orthogonally, or aligned horizontally and vertically. So, another so in this other space, in this new new system, um, my new coordinate system on the right-hand side, my vector looks like it's rotated. It's not pointing mostly in the x-axis like it was for the other one. So that's also really secretly how we do things like rotations, is we'll just um, say, oh, let's look at this in the terms of this rotated coordinate system, and it'll make my vector look like it's turned. But a lot of what we do is we'll just have a matrix that will encapsulate all this information of how to go from one set of axes to another set of axes. How can I express this vector in the language of my local space versus world space, or the camera space, or something like that? Um, under the hood, secretly, a lot of the things, the mechanics of that matrix operating on a vector are related to dot products. So again, another plug for going back and learning dot products <laughs> at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really the same idea under the hood. How much of me is pointing in any in this direction, or different that direction. direction in one system, and then how much of me is pointing in a different system? Mm -hmm. And like the dot products tell you that. That's right. So under the hood, that ended up being intimately related. Um, but now we've got. I, I apologize. We're leaving the cool slides to just show examples for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so, d and correct me if I'm wrong, David. Just so I make sure I remember this right. Mm -hmm. Just to demystify the dot product. It is literally just multiplying components and adding together, right? It it's is. Like, yep. So if you're at home and you're like, dot product sounds really advanced, it's like everything, all of these advanced topics just break down into like addition and subtraction and multiplication, yeah. you know? You just it's always a small thing. Multiply the first component times the first component, plus the second component times the second component, third component times the third component. Just add them together so it's super simple to actually calculate. Mm -hmm. So that's the great part. So in this quick example, I thought it was going to be good to show just a quick visualization to be able to get your to, to get a grasp about the difference between world space and local space. 
And we can think in the world, I think even if I just hit G, right, we can see the world grid that the editor puts for us, right? This is world space or world aligned coordinates, right? So everything has a position in X and Y and Z in the world. So if we move things around, we can uh, get those different components. But to help visualize this, I put a material on here that is world aligned to give you a sense of uh, what world space means, right? So even though the, the material, I'm sorry, the cube is moving, the material stays fixed regardless of position, rotation, or scale. And to help solidify that even more, I think a good example is um, if you duplicate the object, right, you can see that the grids completely overlap each other perfectly because this material is mapped to world space or world units. So basically it takes this pixel that it's rendering and it says, okay, what's your world position on X, Y, and Z? And go ahead and map it to these. When we think about things in local space, it's kind of more what we would expect with, a, with geometry in here, where as the object rotates, it's actually transforming that world position into local space. So that's basically like my space versus your space is the way you can kind of think of uh, world space and local space. The other um, quick visualizer here that I put in here is the, um, the little XYZ widgets. So you can see on the world space examples, even though I'm rotating it, this little Z always stays up, right? This little Y points down to a positive Y and positive X for the red one. But in local space, right, this is also rotating with the object. So we can show the material later on, but there's just very, very simple transform mm -hmm. nodes that just do all this for you, right? You could do the math yourself if you want, or like I said before, there's a lot of things that the computer can do for you. So I, I wanted to add one more piece of intuition to this good visualization too. If we had a details panel open and you clicked one of these cubes, if you thought about this cube in world space, its position in that details panel is the position, the vector from the world zero. You like Unreal has this concept of this world origin, this this center point to the world, and any position, world space position that your little static mesh cube is, is just a vector, it's a line from that zero center to you. And so when you're typing in a transform of like, what is my location of my static mesh in Unreal? You're actually drawing this arrow in X, Y, and Z, you're drawing this vector to this thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when you start to think about this same object in local space, the center of that object is your zero. Yeah. And everything that's happening from it and transformed to it is happening in relation to this object. And so it's like you have a little mini Unreal world moving along for the ride with it, with this you know, local space object. And so I think that's a useful piece of intuition when you start thinking about transforming things into different spaces, is remembering that there's just a, 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 a magical secret vector drawing from the center of the Unreal world to any of your objects in world space. And in local space, that origin sits at the center of the thing you're dealing with. And that's like a good intuition thing mm -hmm. to generate. Yeah. yeah. I can definitely see a, a showcase example for that where you can just hide and show all the arrows going yeah. to all your components. <laughs> it's going to get messy really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Be. If you had weight. <laughs> um, and then I, have, I just have a little Niagara example to elucidate this a little bit further. Um, so uh, I like this visualization because it starts to just create a little bit of intuition. Um, basically, what I have here is. I have my actor, this is my actor position, and this actor has spawned a particle in world space. So the, the, this Niagara system said, I'm making a particle, I'm putting it in the world. I, I put a little printout up here of the world space position of this particle, okay? So if I were to find the origin of the world, the, I am 220 units above the origin in Z. I'm 125 units away from the origin in X and so on. Now the question becomes, what do these numbers look like if I transform this world space ball's position into my local space position? So now I'm saying, instead of being relative to the world, which is just a big vector for, to the world origin, now I'm going to take this same position, but I'm going to draw that same vector to me. Because I'm the center now. I'm the nucleus. This is my world. Uh, and so I can visualize that. Let me turn this one off, turn this one on. So now you see these numbers have changed. And as I move this, well, let me flip back for a second. When I'm in wor world space, no matter what I do with this parent emitter, these numbers are stable. I'm always locked here. This is my position. When I switch over to local space, now you see how I'm relative to this world center. Imagine this unreal world moving with me. 
And now it starts to get interesting because you can start to visualize, I'm just 12 units ahead on, you know, 12, 12 units ahead of it on X. And as I nudge past it, oh, now it's, now it's actually behind me on X. See my local X axis? Okay. So as I move this around, in local space, this guy is very, very relative to me now. And it gets even more interesting when you start to rotate this guy. Awesome. Uh, so I can say, watch the blue number here. Watch it change as I rotate this guy toward it. You can see that the amount of Z distance is increasing as I rotate. And if I get nice and close here, I'm, I'm not any on, on Z there. It turns out if I go into 3D, I'm a little bit offset it on, on I'm offset on Y, so that's why that number is still big. But if I went right to the center of this guy, it's with zero, zero, zero. So now you're starting to get an intuition for what being in local space means, uh, which is really powerful. <laughs> like, this is a big yeah. thing to know. One question people might have, though, is like, why would I do this? And the thing to think of, to know about transforms is that transformation is a, tr is a um, like, language translator. Okay, it basically lets two things speak the same language. And so if I had some ball flying around in the world space, but I want my hand, the palm of my hand, to repel that ball, I need to find a way to compare the direction that my hand is facing to this ball in a way that is like really simple for both of those guys to understand. Like, I just want to move it in Z. I just want to deal with one little piece of it. I don't want to do all these dot products and comparisons. So you transform it into the space of my hand, and now moving away or towards that becomes this incredibly simple thing, like just add a little Z, right? And so without this little translator in the middle telling them to speak the same language, these problems are complicated and hard, and yeah. there's lots of weird math in between. And if you tell them to speak the same language, they can talk to each other really simply. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do this, right? And so, and you, you literally are going to see this everywhere. So this is one of these incredibly fundamental yeah. concepts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second that. Uh, yeah. to, what, to what Wyatt's saying, it's super powerful. And going back to the reflection vector example, that's exactly how we take a number of saying, hey, just trace forward mm -hmm. X amount of units, right? But traces expect world positions. Where do I start my trace in world space, and where do I end my trace in world space? So it's just it's the intermediate step of mm -hmm. like, how do I take I'm at this position and I'm rotated this way, and how do, what is that local forward x on two thousand units? So yeah. that's a perfect uh, use case just from this example set that we're showing. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a couple of functions in the um, Blueprint API that allows you to just flip them as well. Yep, you yep. go back the other direction. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I would I would go one way to get into this space. I would go the opposite way to come out. And those are all the blueprint editor, Niagara, the material editor, all has those yeah. nodes sitting there in the cradle waiting mm -hmm. to be used. It's a little different. Materials have like a pull down where you select which space you want to transform from and to. Mm -hmm. In blueprints, there's like inverse transform and transform. So mm -hmm. like one is for one flipped for the other. Um, and I think the other thing, um, just to, s to solidify the concept for viewers at home, is that we mainly deal with either transforming positions, or, or I'm sorry, transforming vectors or transforming positions, right? Those are like the two main things. That's a know. point of a ton of confusion <laughs> yeah. for people. Um, so it probably is worth spending a minute on it. But there's, I don't know, do you want to take kind of approach it from philosophical <laughs> <laughs> side? Well, um, yeah, I guess one of the things I can say is that the way we generally do our transformations, um, we will ha when we're doing it with positions, we'll make our transforms a little bit bigger so that they can translate things. So it'll do a translation and then a rotation and a scale or something like that. And with vectors themselves, because they don't really have an origin, we don't need this translational aspect to it. It's simply take this direction and rotate it to that direction, or take this direction and scale part of it before you rotate it, yeah. things like that. So when we do our transform, the underlying mathematics in things like the engine are built to be a little bit more general. So they can do all the um, rotations and stuff and translations. And we'll have to tell the engine often, translate this like a position, meaning I want you to do the translation as well as, th as the regular rotations and stuff. Or to tell it, no, this is just a vector, so mm -hmm. you don't have to do uh, an additional translation step. Um, if I take two points in space, the difference between them is a vector. If I take one point in the origin, the difference between those is a vector. 
but a point by itself, if I just want to transform it with the standard computer graphics transform, it'll that computer graphics transform will also have a translation built into it. Mm -hmm. So it's a funny way that we um, differentiate between those things, <laughs> yeah. but it's something to be aware of that people will make this distinction between am I transforming a point at a, or a vector, and mm -hmm. what they're really talking about is do I want to also translate it somehow or not. Yeah, a and so. usually the mental model you have to have when you're thinking about this is do I have a point in space that I care about when I'm doing these comparisons? Because yeah. oftentimes you're just using this as a tool to be able to compare two things in a simpler way. Mm -hmm. That's like a common way to think about why you would use these techniques. And really, you, the, the root of it is, can I compare the two of them irrespective of where they live in the 3D world? And if you can, you can just transform the vectors and talk to each other. And if it really, really matters, my position in 3D space and then my relative position in 3D space and which direction I'm facing, you would transform the full position and then you would deal with where it is mm -hmm. kind of in that stack. Um, that's a that's like kind of a simplification, but I think that might guide people toward a little piece of the intuition for when they come at the problem mm -hmm. is like, do I, do I just have a direction do I, that I care about or, or do I have a direction and exactly where I am in the world that I care about? Mm -hmm. So that might, that might get the juices flying anyways yeah. without yeah. being too far down the rabbit hole. Sometimes I only care about position data, right? Like they yeah, that's true. You know, like it just depends. So yep. I think just, yep. just laying the, fo the foundation of that, like that's an issue. That, like, you have to be able to carpet, or I can't even say the word. Compartmentalize. Thank maybe? you. Tongue twisted. You got to like, oh, yeah. you got to be able to isolate those concepts. Mm -hmm. So Sure. Yeah. We have a question that's mm, uh, rather relevant. Um, can you get the local space reference frame for other actors without calculating the difference manually? Uh, repeat that question one more time. So um, if you want to get local space compared from one to the other, like is that like the difference maybe? So to get the local space reference frame for other actors, so I believe what they're asking is, um, is there a function in, in any of the libraries um, that allows you to get the local space reference frame for another actor rather than the actor, I guess you're you're in? Yeah, um, so we have blueprint functions for that. So oftentimes what you're doing is, the, the real question you're asking is, how do I express me in another guy's space? And oftentimes, if you're getting, trying to find commonality there, you would actually ask that, like in blueprint, you would say, like, what is your transform, mm -hmm. basically? And then you could say something like, give me the inverse of that which kind of gets me from how you got to where you are back out, if that makes some sense. And so you can basically, we have just have blueprint functions that would ask for the, the local transform of an object in any of those coordinate spaces. So there's, those, those yeah. are all, we have blueprint functions for that stuff basically. So yeah. often people will do things where they have, um, one object will have its transform that takes it from a local space to the world space. Mm -hmm. So in terms of my local coordinates, I'll put this as input and then give me world coordinates as output. And if two objects have that, then you can actually concatenate them. You can say, one, I'll take its information, and I'll turn it into world information, and then I'll use the inverse transform for the other guy to go from world to his local space. So usually you'll take one person's transform that goes local to world, and then multiply it by somebody else's that goes from world to his local, and then you have a new transform that'll go from one local space to another local space. So that's one of the really cool things about transforms we didn't really get into, is that you can often multiply them together and make a transform that goes from where you want to another place. Mm -hmm. So instead of going from um, my local to world, and then from world to your local, you can go directly from my local to your local space yeah. Yeah. by multiplying these two transforms together. So that's something that's pretty fun. And I guess it is the, the breadth of possibilities of what you can do here. Um, might be a reason why there isn't a specific, like, specific function just for do this for my actors, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for what for what it's worth, if if it's something that's common enough, it probably already exists. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy to after we're done, we can search around in blueprints too. Um, there's uh, there I know there's like distance functions, like you put the two actors in, mm -hmm. and I think that only just gives you the length. But there might be another one that that is very specific without having to uh -huh. like do an inverse transform and be like get actor location. But we can help either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also realizing I didn't show the in-game example of transforms. Do you mind if I oh, yeah, hop into it. Fortnite really quick? Get, get this, in there. Yeah. This will be very quick. It looks um, cool, so yeah, do it. Oh, we gotta move the uh, move this over here. So this is this is a real-world example uh, that I created for um, creative mode inside of Fortnite, where we have these little um, 
they're called color changing cubes. So as you're racing down the street, you and your team uh, run over these little slabs of uh, concrete over here and it changes to your team color. So we can visualize it here. And you can see wherever I jump um, onto the cube itself, it's actually starting uh, its transition origin at that point. So this is another example of transforms. There's actually two levels of transforms going on here. And one thing we didn't talk about is um, UV space, right? When we talk about uh, world coordinates uh, and local space, but each object actually has a, a two-dimensional coordinate system called UV, which is where how we map our textures, right? So in this case, no matter which way the object is oriented, wherever I jump and hit it, you can see it's actually being translated and transformed properly into UV space, and then we just play a little material animation. So just want to show that in another real-world example of that uh, in action. I love how that looks. It's super cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, can I drive that? Yeah, sure. Okay, onward and upward to the roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this is a kind of a topic change, although Still has none of this is really a topic change mm -hmm. because it's all kind of the <laughs> like all, all these things are kind of the same problems in the sense that vectors and comparing them and asking questions about them is the root of pretty much everything we're talking about today, mm -hmm. or at least trying to figure out what the vector, vector is that I care about, I guess. Um, this example I chose because it starts to get into a couple of topics which normally we wouldn't cover on like a lighthearted introduction to simple game development <laughs> math <laughs> concepts. But I, I think it's actually perfect for exactly that reason because it hopefully it will maybe demyst demystify some stuff. But we're actually going to get into some ta calculus. Um, and don't worry, this stuff is actually deceptively simple. Um, but let's start with the goal. So what is the goal? So what we have here is um, a Niagara emitter which is placing particles on a spline. The spline, um, nobody really cares, but it's a Bezier spline. The only reason I say that is because at the end of the day, this is a mathematically generated shape. So I have control points like where do I start? Which direction do I take off in, which was we, we would call our tangent, which is like, oh, I'm gonna, I start at this position, I zoom off in this direction, and then I have an end point, and then I have another tangent, which is which way am I coming in, right? And when you, with those fee four pieces of information, uh, the math, it turns out, is actually shockingly simple. You just interpolate all of those four things along a little value, and when you do that, instead of being <coughs> four lines between them, you get this lovely swoopy little curve. It's a satisfying shape, right? Mm -hmm. There are some questions to answer about this curve, though, and some interesting qualities to it. This is just kind of like a, it's a three-dimensional shape, but it is dimensionless. It's not a three-dimensional thing like a tube. So you have to ask this question of like, what is there a coordinate system that has an X, Y, and Z locally along this shape? Because I want to do something cool, like take these meshes and actually cause them to swoop along it. And you can see how they kind of like rotate and twist and torque along that shape. We would basically call this kind of like the local coordinate system of each point of this spline. How do we find that is the question that we would like to answer, basically. Uh, turns out it's, it's kind of the idea behind it is kind of straightforward. Um, but it takes a little bit of calculus. So All right. pass it off. Yeah, so let's. We talked about vectors. Now we're going to talk a little bit about slope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's I like about that last image why I showed is that instead of having just two different coordinate systems, like a world coordinate system and a single local coordinate system, like a camera system uh, with camera forward and up and left or whatever, you could at each little point along that curve have your own little coordinate system if you liked. And we're going to work towards that. Uh, but first, let's just talk about something even simpler. We're going to talk about slope, rate of change, things like that. Here's a really simple function. It's not a big complicated curve in three-dimensional space. It's just a little curve in 2D here. It could be like a height field, just a slice of a height field. Uh, it could be pretty much anything you want. Um, so the green line is some function of x. And um, I'm going to ask the question of, at this particular point, this value of x, that's my parameter drawing my line, what's the slope of, the, of this little green line, my function? And the intuition that I want you to have is that if I get really close to a line, as long as it's not 
uh, doesn't have a jump in it or something funky. As long as it's a nice smooth line you drew, if I get close enough, it's going to look like a straight line. That's it. And with straight lines, if I asked you what's the slope of a straight line, well, you know how to do that. That's just the rise over the run. And wherever you calculate this on a straight line, you'll get the same slope. So if we take that back to our little curve, I'll say, I'm just going to pretend your curve is a straight line. I'm going to sample it at two different points. And you see I compute um, the rise, how much my function has gone up between those two points, and the run, how far apart those two points were on in x. So I'm going to calculate it <coughs> at x, and x plus a little delta x. And I'll get delta x will be my run, how far over I've gone, and the difference in the function will be my rise. So that, that's my good approximation for the slope, because I just said I'm calling it a straight line. And as you make the distance between these two sample points, x and x plus dx, which makes those closer together if you make that dx smaller and smaller, well then you're zooming in more and more on the curve, and the curve's getting to look a lot more like a straight line, so it'll get more and more accurate. And if that line wasn't height, let's just say it was the distance of a ball from a wall. It's, I'm throwing a ball away from me or something like that. Instead of slope, I could say that this is speed. It's how far did it travel, distance, divided by time, the time that it traveled. So the speed and slope, in this case, are really just the same thing. It's I'm evaluating a function a little bit later. I'm evaluating it now and dividing by how long it took. So that's um, rate of change. Now what we're really doing is we're just talking about something called derivative. Let's just calculus. It's uh, This is what they call the derivative operator. An operator just means it's going to take a function and it's going to give you back another function. You're going to take in a function f and it's going to tell you the slope of f. And it uses these two d's. One is the change or the difference in f and the other is the difference in the input that I put in. So it's just what we were talking about before. It's just computing that slope and it's in the analytic case, it's when the little run gets very, very, very small, as small as you can make it. Now, often you'll just have um, functions. You won't have a nice smooth function. I won't tell you the function is x cubed or something. You'll just have data points. And there, you won't have the option to make that little run smaller. You can just sample your two different points in space and compute a derivative that way. But let's take this idea a little further. So here's a curve in space. This is meant to be a curve in three-dimensional space. Um, and I'm going to pretend that it's really a path that a little particle, my little smiley face there, pretty cool, huh? He <laughs> travels <laughs> along this curve. I told you the Bob Ross is <laughs> 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 So he starts there, and at a later time, he's moved up the curve to this location. So there's a little time difference there. His position now, instead of just being a single value, it's three values. It's an x value, a y value, and a z value. So I can subtract the two, and I can make a little vector that goes between them. And that vector just points from one smiley face to the other one. Um, and I could say, well, if I divide it by the time it took him to get from one point to the other, that's how fast that little guy was traveling. And if I, it's approximating the actual derivative at that point. But what's cool about it is if this approximation, that little delta t, the distance that he traveled is very small, then the vector I get is going to be a perfect tangent to the curve. You see when the, they're pretty far apart, it's not such a good approximation to the tangent. But as they get closer and closer together, it's going to become the tangent to the curve. And the tangent being kind of the forward direction along yeah. the curve, just to clarify. That's right, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So it, what we really want to get is, I'd like to get a little local basis. And I want to get a forward direction that he's traveling, and I want to get two directions that are at right angles to that. That would give me a, a teeny little local coordinate system. So um, this is starting to feel a little bit like physics. So I said that the velocity was the rate of change of position. It was my little delta in the position. So now let's take our little guy again. He's traveling with some velocity in that direction. It's going to take him up the curve. And then a little later, he's going to have a different velocity. He's turned. Maybe he's slowed down at the same time. Uh, and I can compare these two different velocities. I can say, here was his initial velocity. It's pretty big, and it's pointing mostly to the right on the screen. And then later, it's pointing much more up. And it's not nearly as big. So there's a difference in those velocities. That's just how the velocity has changed. And um, you know, from uh, even driving a car, that's acceleration, how I change my velocity. So that's all we've done right here. 
the acceleration is really the rate of change of our velocity. That's going to be a little vector. And that little vector is going to point, um, some will point back against the original velocity if you're slowing it down. Some will point in the direction of the velocity if you're accelerating and speeding it up. But part of that velocity vector is going to have to point in a direction that's perpendicular to the direction you are already going because I'm turning. So some of it's going to point in a direction. Part of my velocity vector is going to point in a turning direction. And you can use the dot product to actually pull that piece out. You can say, here's my acceleration vector. Give me the part of it that's not in the direction of my velocity. I, I won't go into the details there, but this is an opportunity for you <coughs> to say, I wonder how I can use the dot product to actually do that. And that would give me a second vector that's orthogonal at a right angle to the first vector. And then if you want another vector that's um, at a right angle to those two, we haven't really talked about it, but there's a cool trick. It's called a cross product. And it takes two vectors, and it gives you one that points out the plane that those two made. So you could do that to get a third direction. And that hand thing you did is yes. what all of us <laughs> do every time you think about a cross product. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's a, Just burn that into your mind, because you're like, oh yeah, it just does that. You get another one. Are you counting silly? No, I'm doing cross product. <laughs> yeah. So everybody will point out their thumb, their forefinger, and then their middle finger. And it ends up being a little local x, y, and z coordinate system. And they'll call the thumb as maybe x, the index finger is y, and then z is their middle finger. <laughs> 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 um, but Bill was going to show some examples of derivatives. So derivatives were what we were just talking about, where I just take the difference in things and divide by. Before we pass mm -hmm. off, yeah. we have a small microphone problem. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes to fix that. We will be all be right back. Sure. OK. <laughs> all right, I think we're back. <laughs> we fixed the problem. We can now all hear David. OK, good. Um, as, as well as possible. <laughs> all right, over to Bill. Yeah, uh, so to, to reemphasize what David just said, um, again, bringing it down to its simplest element and idea is that we're really just calculating differences. And um, Wyatt's example and, and David's slides of um, you know calculating along a spline and, and establishing a tangent and so forth are perfectly good use cases, and um, we do this very frequently. But I wanted to show an example that is of the same concept, but with a different nature, and that's with um, image techniques, or using image data to be able to calculate uh, differences. So inside, uh, again, I'm using examples from Creative Mode. Uh, this is all free to play. So Creative Mode is Fortnite's little side shot uh, mode where you can actually kind of be a game developer, and we have all these different devices and props, and you can make your own games. and uh, in the menu, we've got things that are called, we call them camera filters. If, if you're familiar with post-process materials, that's actually what we're using inside the editor. And uh, it's probably worth actually explaining really quick what a post-process material is. It's just, you can imagine the, the game is rendering, the, the engine is rendering an image that goes to the user. We actually give them an extra step uh, to be able to say, let's make adjustments to those images. So it's like taking an image in Photoshop. And you can you know, blast colors, you can clamp ranges, whatever you want to do, right? That's basically what a post-process material is. So I had the idea, I'm a huge fan of um, like 80s synth wave and stuff like that, like the new retro wave of like, uh, music that's come out. And I was like, we should make like a retro filter. So we actually call it retro. And it's like super obnoxious, uh, hopefully in the best possible way. But <laughs> it, you know, it outlines the character. We can see like the wireframe on all of the uh, 
geometry in the world, right? And we have to start thinking of how to approach this problem technically, right? Because, um, like, you can see, like, the, the, the faces on the, on the geometry are actually faceted now. So it's actually ignoring um, any kind of normal information that's on the geometry. So it's like, how do we do this? Oh, I'm blasting away here. There we go. Uh, how do we do this with a game that's got, you know, tens of thousands of uh, static meshes and skeletal meshes and stuff? Like, we can't go back and change those. So a lot of all this is done is actually with calculus and with derivatives. So one thing I thought would be good is actually to show something like this in Photoshop of just the basics of how we're establishing this kind of data. So if you ever look, it's probably worth actually showing um, inside the editor really quick. If you ever load the editor, you can go over here to um, where it says the lighting model or view mode. You can go to buffer visualizations. And if you do overview, it's just a very quick um, overview of the major ones that are commonly used. So you can think of the editor or the engine is actually like rendering multiple passes of all these different things. And um, it's kind of compositing all that data. That's like a gross oversimplification, but it's, it's putting those those, all that data together to render the final image. So you can see actually one that's really important up here on the, on the top right is world normal. So going back to vectors, this is our, which way our geometry at, at that certain point is facing. That's what I would bounce off of if I were a flying yeah. ball. Exactly, yeah, it's <laughs> the same data, right? And then there's this one right down here on the bottom left. Maybe I'll just make it bigger really quick. And is it seen depth? Yeah. There we go. Um, ignore the stepping out to infinity. But as you can see, uh, what it's doing here is we're writing a, data, uh, a piece of data per pixel that actually just tells us distance, right? And we're, we're kind of dividing it because you can think of, uh, you know, in the engine, a value of 1 is pure white. So if this wasn't divided or scaled, this would just be like looking into the sun, right? It would just be like <laughs> super bloom city. So we're just taking that data, just think of it as dividing it by like 1,000 or 2,000. So as things get closer, right, they actually get closer to black. The farther away they get, they actually turn to white, right? So it's just a distance measurement. So going back to Photoshop, to put this uh, as, as an example that we can kind of break down piece by piece, I've taken here, uh, uh, we use the high-res screenshot tool that's built into the editor, and it can actually write uh, HDR formats. That means it's uh, floating point, just like our engine works. And this is a depth example. This is some uh, props that we have in creative mode. And let's take this depth. I'm going to duplicate it. And Photoshop has some basic math operations. And I want to subtract them, right? So what happens here is it's gone completely black because it's evaluating every pixel and it's saying whatever, like 0.38 minus 0.38, right? When you, when you subtract from itself, it's always going to be zero. But what happens if I slide? I don't know if it didn't work. Hold on one second. There you go. Did it work? It might be this. Oh, I'm not on the right layer, I think. Let's try this one more time. Oh, yeah, keep selecting the levels up layer. All right. Over and over Photoshop's again. not cooperating, sorry. Give me one second. There you go. There we go. So what I did here is I took this duplicate layer, and I slid it over exactly one pixel, right? And we're actually calculating a slope, right, to, to the, what would we call this, I guess, positive x, if you will. And it's returning that difference value. So, and that difference, even though there's negative values here, which Photoshop doesn't really deal with very well, um, that difference, though, is actually appearing as uh, grayscale values. So it's actually just edge detection. This is how, um, I was even watching an, a, a video about how they do license plate identification for like tolls and stuff like that. Like to read your license plate, they do so bell edge stuff like this. So it's like <laughs> this is commonly used, right? So if we just do this a couple more times, and I've got it already done for us. So maybe we go one to the right, one to the left, one up, and one down. We can see we actually get a pretty good approximation of where our differences on our edges. And again, this isn't a, a, a really good example because of um, Photoshop not working well with floating point. It's not uh, floating point values. It's not really like the editor or something like Substance, but like just doing some quick like level adjustments and so forth, we can actually start to like filter out the noise and get the data that we want. So how is this data used? So like in the material, let's say we we say I really want the small fine edges. I can bring this back up. I really want the small differences, and that's what's going to be our wireframe that's showing up on the um, on the meshes itself. And I would use that value because it goes you know, from 0 to whatever. And I can clamp it. So it's just in 0 to 1 space. And then we use that with a LERP. Uh, alert basically says, take an A and then a B, and then just switch between A and B based on a 0 to 1. And then we can isolate other areas like this wireframe back here and just make that a different color, right? So even though there's a lot going on visually, it's just a bunch of small steps like that of, of just taking those differences, remapping them to different ranges, clamping them, scaling them, dividing them, 
One trick I can give that I used a lot with this is inverse slurping, which is really useful. So instead of going from 0 to 1, you actually give it A and B, which might be like 300 to 1,000, and it remaps 300 to 1,000 to 0 to 1 space. So it's really good mm -hmm. for, for computer graphics stuff. So that's it for my example. Ah, cool. I love the way that looks. Thank you. Uh, huh. I, don't, I don't recall if we get back to the uh, my other spline. Or we had a plan, but I could go back and show the Taurus, too. Oh, yeah. If you, you want to show like that now? It, yeah, let's well. go. Yeah. Uh, just because, like, yeah, in the context fun. of the rise over run conversation, mm -hmm. I think this image starts to make a little more sense. Um, if, if we're thinking about your diagram there, mm -hmm. and I'm taking a little step forward, and I'm getting this difference between the two of them, the direction in between them is that tangent you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm taking a step from here to here, and this point and this sample point have a, a difference in their direction, and so the tips of these are subtly different. Well, that's this guy. Mm -hmm. And then as this guy curves around, these, uh, you know, this, this part of the coordinate system curves around, they, there's a subtle difference in how these guys are facing. Turns out that's this guy. So. Uh, you can see how I'm basically getting a whole bunch of interesting vectors and coordinate information out of what really amounts in small changes in like a little one-dimensional function, which is I'm advancing forward on this little curve in time. Um, so it's it's kind of a cool, it's a cool trick basically, mm -hmm. and you're just subtracting things from each other for the most <laughs> part. Like it's really not, um, it's it's really not as crazy as it sounds, I guess. Um, I also had just an, another example um, of another analytical shape, just like the uh, uh, the spline that we, we saw earlier. And this is basically working the same way, except now it's like a three-dimensional shape. And if I fly inside, at every one of these little positions, you can imagine these as little vertices of my torus here, you've got these little subtle changes in difference as the torus starts to bend around. And each one of these changes in difference is going to result in these arrows pointing slightly away from each other as it advances and marches around the shape. And as you do, and you calculate your little difference between them, the coordinate system, which is basically, which is the orientation of my little local point on this torus, it just kind of falls out the other end. It just kind of, the math just kind of gracefully tells you, hey, you have this neat function that makes a torus. Oh, and you just happen to also have all this other information. For the mo mostly, I just think this is neat. <laughs> uh, but there's actually a th there's a, a bunch of cool things when it comes to kind of particle effects that come out of this too. Because you imagine that I'm creating this kind of torus, and what it really is is this like blob of vectors. It's a blob of directions. So if I wanted to, I could say hey, I'm going to pretend I'm at this point on the torus, but I'm just a point in space, I'm a particle, start flying in the direction of this red arrow. <laughs> and then as I start to fly around, I can keep asking where I am along the torus. And so I get this like vortex swirling of particles, and that's kind of coming for free just out of the idea that I made the torus in the first place, mm -hmm. which I think is just kind of, it's just a, kind of a remarkable thing. Oh. It's like um, this happy accident almost. <laughs> And it's a result of these functions being able to be evaluated in the way that they are. Um, so it's just a bunch of cool stuff that falls <laughs> on the other end, basically. Did you uh, use the basis of a mesh to create the all the locations for no? Particles? So so this this is our what we call our torus location module in Niagara. Okay. Each of these is a particle. Each of these little gnomons that you see here uh, <coughs> is a particle, and this is basically a, we, we would call it an analytical function. But this is just a piece of math that says what a torus is. All right. Uh, and so, and, and you can either point, put the particles on the surface of it, or you can put them distributed throughout the center with whatever density you want. So that's one of the built-in modules that we had to write mm -hmm. for Niagara artists who wanted to make things swirl around or to spawn them in a donut <laughs> or whatever <laughs> you want to do. The world is your oyster. Yeah. Um, but th this is one of the built-in behaviors, and it is it is math making a torus, basically. Awesome. And, and that's the beauty of it is, since math made the torus, math gives us all these other things on the torus kind of for free. So that's why it works. Basically. That's great. Yeah. Ah, OK. So I was going to talk a little bit more about, um, about slopes. <laughs> so 
what Bill showed you a little while ago was um, the thing with the images where he slid it off by a pixel in one direction or a pixel in the other direction. So his image is really a function of two variables, a function of x and y or u and v or something like that. And the question is, are, I know how to compute the slope of a function of one variable. I have my curve, and I knew how to compute its, its slope. What does it mean if I have two variables? Well, it's just what Bill showed you. It's I can um, compute the slope in one variable in x. I can compute the slope in the other variable in y. The little picture I have here, I've got two pictures. One's a nice little height field. And on the height field, I've colored it so that uh, all the heights that are at the same elevation share the same band, a little color that goes around to the contour. But then the other height field, I've drawn a cross on it and a little x and y coordinate system. And I'm just saying, I could ask right at the center of that coordinate system what the slope is if you only travel in x. And what's the slope if I only travel in Y? And that's like what Bill was doing when he was offsetting his pixels. And what you're doing at this case is actually called a partial derivative. It's just like doing a regular derivative, but we give it a different notation. A regular derivative, a function, just one variable. It gives us hard D. And if I'm doing a partial derivative, it means I'm taking, I'm going to look, in this case, to my left and right in X, and I'm only taking a I'm only look, evaluating it in that sense. I'm freezing y, and I'm going to look to left and right in x. Um, but that's all really a partial derivative means. It means I'm differentiating. I'm taking a derivative. I'm looking at the slope. If I only travel in one direction, there are many possible directions I could go. Um, and why I was going to show us something cool before we <laughs> before we move on. Before we move on. Before <laughs> I show you something cool. <laughs> so. Um, I made a little thing to help you think about what, what, why what David just said was relevant, basically. And uh, the thing that he'll get to in more detail is uh, this idea that you've got this direction, this slope, this height field, which is uh, a scalar. It's a, fl it's a single value. It's just a number. But buried in that number, if you look at it at the right way, are directions. There's a vector buried in this number. And if you're working in a 3D coordinate space, those vectors are 3D, three-dimensional things that are encoded in this little one-dimensional idea. And that's, that's pretty cool. And a whole bunch of the stuff that we do in kind of modern computer graphics falls out of this. Uh, one of the ones that you're going to hear a lot is this term signed distance field or distance field. They've become ubiquitous in computer graphics um, because they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're cheap to evaluate, and they can combine together in interesting, easy ways. And there's just a million reasons why distance fields are awesome. But what they are is a if you have a point in space, so let's say I've got my little Albert Einstein here. I've got a point on Albert. A distance field would basically just say, from any other point out here in the world, or even inside of Albert's brain, uh, that'd be an interesting place to live. Um, it's going to say, how far away am I? And then if it's a signed, and that's a distance field, how far away from this point am I? And it's just a single number that encodes, I'm 33 units away, sir. And you're like, great, thanks, good, good information. If you're a signed distance field, you guys might hear that term. All that means is, is that if I go inside, that number's negative. It's the only th that's the only thing that means. So if somebody says, oh, I'm working with SDFs, that sounds like a fancy thing. Okay. It's a sign distance field, which is a single number that can be negative. That's all that is, OK? Uh, I've made a little point cloud to visualize the inside of Albert's head. Uh, and basically, you can see on the surface, that distance field would be 0. <coughs> okay, So wherever this kind of function that we would evaluate to say, what is the, like the distant function, how far away am I, wherever that is 0, that's the surface. So everywhere on Albert, the function is 0. And then as I get further away out or in, that number starts to increase by the distance. So it's this really, really simple idea. Um, what's cool about it, though, is what David will show you why this works and how this works. But what's cool about that is this little guy encodes direction in it, kind of magically, um, via this little bit of partial, you know, differential, you know, dis um, Derivative. derivatives. Thank you. Uh, you. You take these little derivatives and it encodes these directions. So I visualize them. I basically put particles 
at zero, which means I put all those particles right at the zero point on Albert where the function evaluates is zero. And I've then pulled out of that little field the, what we call the gradient. And that is basically a direction. I flipped it so that you can kind of visualize it a little better. But basically what this would be is if I'm at a point on the surface, if I move away from it, that little field would say how far away am I and which direction would I have to go to get back to it, the closest point to me on it, basically. And so if I went in, those arrows would kind of point inward toward Albert's head. And as I fly out here, those are pointing the other direction. So there's this lovely kind of blob of gradients, these directions <laughs> that are encoded in this distance field. Um, and then I'll just give you a little preview of the kind of fun things we can do with <laughs> this knowledge. Um, all of this here is uh, falls out of comparing vectors, just like we've been doing this whole time. Got a, some dot products and some other things going on. And then there's one little extra thing, which is the magic of pulling this gradient out of this distance field, which David will talk about. Um, and we also happen to get some of this motion with cross product as well, uh, which, remember your little hand thing, mm -hmm. we, we basically need to get ourselves a, a vector which is you know, pointing away from that surface. <laughs> and so some dot products, a cross product, and this distance field creates these orbs which roll around poor Albert's <laughs> head. Um, and this is all done with the built-in nodes in Niagara. So it's kind of a fun visualization. I'm glad there were little orbs instead of ants. <laughs> 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 yeah. we, we tried something like that. It was really creepy. So <laughs> which one do I? Leave it for another day. Yeah. Can you go back to your slides? Yeah. All right. That was a wise, cool example. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, gradient, which is a generalization of slope, and and why it's important and why it's really useful. But first thing I'm going to say is it's just a generalization of slope. We've already got some notation. That's our derivative notation, a d f dx. And this is gradient. The notation for a gradient is this funny upside down triangle. It's called nabla, but everybody just calls it grad. Um, nabla is pretty funny. I had I was really curious, like, where does that name come from? And so the person who, one of the earlier practitioners of uh, differential um, calculus, uh, decided that it looked like a harp. So, <laughs> nabla is okay. some Hellenistic Greek. <laughs> it means harp. <laughs> but right. it means for us, it means gradient. It's an upside down triangle. It sounds like <laughs> or something like that. And it generalizes the idea of slope. And what do I mean by it generalizes the idea of slope? It it works on functions that are more than one variable, so multiple variables, and will give us some idea of, of a slope for it. Well, here's a height field. And I've, again, I've drawn these bands. All those bands are at the same elevation in my height field. But if I give you a height field, you could try to figure out which way, and I tell you you're at a certain location on this mountain, you could figure out which way is downhill. Even though the height field is just a scalar function of x and y, you could use that to figure out which way do I have to go to go downhill or to go most uphill. So what the gradient does is it tells you in the x and y space which way you have to go to go in the most uphill direction. And if you know that at a local, if you zoom in close enough to a height field like this, the surface instead of looking curved, just like with our curve, if I got close enough, it looked like a little straight line. Well, if you really zoomed in a lot on this surface, it would start to look like little flat patches of ground. And each little flat patch of ground, it would have a a single direction that was most uphill. They're not horizontally flat, they're just like shingles on a roof. So I want you to think about height fields. If I get really close, they kind of look like roof shingles. And you could tell me which way this little roof shingle is pointing to go straight up. And then you could also say on this little flat area, which way would I, if I go diagonally, what slope would I experience? So the gradient, it, it turns out it's a vector. We write them as vectors. And the way we compute them is we take the derivative in the x direction, if it's a 2D function, in the x direction and the y direction. And that makes a little arrow for us. I'll show you in a second what that looks like. That points in the most direction you have to go to really go uphill. And if you have a gradient and you take that product with itself in the square root, you'll end up with the length of it. But that would actually tell you what the slope is if I traveled in that most uphill direction. But here's something, maybe this image is a little bit less well, I wouldn't say the other image was super cool, but this one might be a little less so. But on the left-hand side, there's my little mountain. Again, I've colored it um, so you can see the different levels of elevation. And then down on the ground, projected down beneath it, those are the curves in the XY space. 
that if I stay on those curves, I don't go up or downhill. And then I've copied that little XY space over into this other image on the right. And if you just pick any point in XY, it'll have a corresponding Z, a corresponding height. But if you compute the gradient at any of those points, it will be pointing perpendicular to the lines of constant elevation. So if I just compute these two partial derivatives, I'll take x and I'll sample it. I'll take rather f and I'll sample it moving left and right in x, and I'll take f and I'll sample it moving up and down in y, and I'll get a little vector. And that little vector is going to point in the direction that I would travel to really go uphill. And imagine Einstein's head is in the middle <laughs> of that swirl. <laughs> <laughs> and you could also use it the other way. You could say that's the most uphill direction, so I'm going to go exactly the other direction if I want to go down. Um, so here's an, another example. This is 3D. So this is, instead of Einstein, this is just some green guy. <laughs> <laughs> and what I've drawn next <coughs> to him is I've drawn these different sheets wrapping around him. Each of these sheets, if you're on one of those sheets and you stay on those sheets, you're at always the same distance from his head. So anywhere on those one of those sheets, you could say, um, if I stay on this sheet, I'm not getting any closer and I'm not getting any further from the head. The point that I'm closest to changes, like I could be on the sheet near his nose, and that's the tip of his nose I'm closest to, I can move around to his ear, but I'm always the same distance from the, from the skin, the closest distance. So those, each of those surfaces, they call them an isocontour, an isosurface. Iso just means same. Here it's the same distance. So that's my function. I'm going to say my function is the distance, the distance from his head, the shortest distance. And I can compute its gradient, just like Wyeth has showed you before. Um, it corresponds to a bunch of little arrows, and these little arrows are pointing in the direction um, that will make that's the most uphill direction. And by uphill, I mean increases the distance the most, the quickest. So if I take one of those little arrows, I'm on the outer sheet, and I go in that direction, then my distance from the head will increase the fastest. Or I could say I'm going to go in exactly the opposite direction, and that'll tell me what direction do I have to go to get straight to the sky's skin as fast as possible. And with a distance field, it's really cool because I know two things. I've computed this gradient, these little arrows, and I also already know how far I am. Mm. So if I'm on the third sheet out, I know I'm, maybe these sheets reach a centimeter, I'm three centimeters. And I also know the direction I have to travel to get to the skin. So I could take my current position, I could take the, the opposite of the gradient, it'll point at the skin, and move in that direction three centimeters, and I should be right on the skin again. And that's exactly, in my example, swirling around on Einstein, the first thing I do is spawn a particle anywhere, and then I just ask for the gradient and how far away I am, and it just snaps perfectly right to his face, because we have those two pieces of information. So that's like the very first thing that I do whenever I create a particle in that sim. Can you, can you honestly call that like transferring it to distance field space then? Like, is that term ever used? Well, like, people will call it something like this, where you snap to the face, like the closest point transform. Okay. I have a point in space, and I'm going to transform it to the closest point on whatever this object is. Um, but that's really the sort of stuff I think we wanted to cover for the most part today. Yep. We were talking about, um, first, we, we talked a little bit about vectors, and we talked about um, functions and slope. And then we brought it back to how these functions, these slopes, can become vectors again. And they can be at every step along the way. They're important tricks for us to play with them. <laughs> they um, they did ask if if you could define derivative. Define the derivative? Sure. Um, let me see if I go back in the slide a little bit. I think. We had it there at some point. Yeah. yeah I remember. I'll find. Here's the slide. So, if I have a function f. Its derivative is really its slope at a certain point. So you tell me a point, and I will compute its slope. And I'll locally approximate my function by a little straight line, like we did a little earlier. I'll show you the earlier slide, kind of like this. A little straight line. I'll evaluate it further and closer and divide by the distance in between. It was this rise over run, in this case, distance over time. And that's my definition of a derivative. It's going to be something that takes a function and a position and we'll give you back another value. And the value is just the local slope. And in the, um, in the more sort of mathematical definition, it's the limit as the, um, the run part gets smaller and smaller. So my two little sample points get closer and closer together. But that's just all, all the derivative is in this case. Okay. It's just and the local slope of the function. And intuition-wise, uh, almost every time we talk about this, like we have the, the little spline 
or we have this distance field that's living in a 3D coordinate system and you want to figure out which direction is encoded magically in there. Almost every time we deal with this, and it's exactly true of Bill's screen space example as well, we're just moving forward a little bit, moving backward a little bit, get the difference between those two things and this stuff kind of falls out of it. And when you want your th three dimensional vector to fall out of this single scalar field, this single value, you're basically doing that little comparison in all three of those directions uh, and you're getting how much of me is pointing in each one mm -hmm. of those and together those three pieces of information would make a 3D vector. Or in the case of 2D, it's like I go, I go a little bit on r right and left, a little bit up and down and then I get a, a 2D vector falls out of that. So. Um, I think it's useful to have this mm -hmm. visualization of seeing it on the graph and understanding the kind of mathematical piece and seeing the symbols, the mathematical symbols, getting comfortable with like, what is that little grad triangle and what is this, what is this D oh. partial mm -hmm. derivative thing? Like it's nice, even if you don't remember, I think it's fine. You just start to build them into your intuition. But oftentimes the equally important thing to remember is that often we're just, we're just talking about Moving around a little bit in, in a bunch of in a, however many directions our coordinate system is, and asking for those little differences between them, and that's really that's the trick, yeah. I guess, would be the way to say it. Uh, it's so simple when you put it that way, which is why I think this stuff is kind of neat. It demystifies it. It did for me anyway. It seemed impossible to me. I'm going to calculate partial <laughs> derivatives of some calculus something or other, and it's like what? And then no, no, no. I'm just going to subtract a couple things. And you're like oh, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> and that gets me a direction. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of neat, you know, I just think that's cool. Yeah. yeah, I guess another way to think about it is it's how much does my function change if I change the input a teeny bit? So if I'm at this point and I change my input just a little bit, how much does my function change? I'm going to turn that into a fraction. How much my function changed divided by how much my input changed. So yeah. if my function doesn't change at all, I get zero out. If it changes a lot, I'll probably get a big number out. <laughs> all right. Um, we have had a few questions come in. Some of them are a little bit more general, um, but I think that definitely applies to the topics. Um, I think I've seen Quaternions mentioned about five times in, in <laughs> <laughs> hey boy. Uh, five times in chat. So um, one of the questions was, do we need to understand Quaternions All when right. we're using Unreal Engine? I got this. <laughs> uh, the answer is pretty much no. Um, I use them every day because we use them as the bones of our mesh orientation and rotation work in Niagara. So when you have a mesh particle and it spins around some world or local coordinate system or in its own mesh particle space, we use coordinates, uh, quaternions to represent that rotation. Um, will you ever really understand mathematically what is going on with quaternions? Probably not. Most humans won't, <laughs> and I think that's fine. There's a piece of it if you wanted to go and start reading. If you just talk about, maybe watch a Khan Academy video on complex numbers, that's the first step toward understanding quaternions. But that's not even important right now. Don't, don't even worry about that. Here's what a quaternion is, to demystify it a little bit. It's a direction, and you spin around it. So I've got an orange. I stick a pencil through the orange, and I twist it. That's a quaternion. In its most fundamental sense, Right, and mm -hmm. please yeah, clarify if perfect. you th think there's I sh there's more I should say. But to me, that that is the most fu foundational way that you could understand a quaternion is stick a <laughs> stick a pencil through an orange and spin it, mm -hmm. and the quaternion encodes which direction the pencil is fa going, like in world space or whatever, and how much spin happened. And there's a bunch of really weird stuff buried in quaternions, and why they work is magical and cool. Um, but you don't have to know any of that stuff. You just have to know what it is that it's encoding. Um, I will say, though, that it's almost impossible for a human to type in a quaternion to make a rotation. It's a, there's way too much going on under the hood. There's sort of like deconstructed trig functions and half angles, and there's a bunch of strange things happening. So a, a human would not ever be expected to type in a quaternion to rotate something. Instead, we would use a different paradigm. Um, like just yaw, pitch, and roll or mm -hmm. whatever, which is exactly what Unreal does. It abstracts all of that. But the F transform in Unreal, the thing that holds rotations, translation, scales, has a quaternion in it. But we don't expose those to people because they're not human parsable, really. They are if you truly understand them, but I defy you to really just sit there and write <laughs> <laughs> the quaternion for some arbitrary rotation. It just doesn't really happen. And you but can if you could take that intuition away, I think it would be successful. And you can see... Um, 
how crazy they can get by just rotating um, an object inside the editor right, and you can look at the values and see how they're flipping between you know negative mm -hmm. ninety or ninety, um, and just. I was sure. trying to grasp that at some point, um, and just understand why is it doing this? And it's like, oh, because there's a lot more crazy stuff going on. There's interesting things yeah. under the hood happening there. Um, so, unless you're really going to go deep tech art, like writing complex particle behaviors or something like that, um, you don't really have to understand them. Just know that it's a rotation around an axis. Because yeah, well, I guess the only thing I would add is that sometimes you have different ways you can represent rotation. Some people do a matrix. Some people will use a quaternion. Mm. And quaternions are much better just for rotations because if you want to blend it between two of them, that works really well. Yeah. So if you find yourself in a position where you want to blend between different rotations, then a quaternion framework is a good one to use because they're always rotations. And But if you have a matrix framework and you want to blend between rotations, you get stuff that's not rotations in between them. That's not <laughs> always good. So that's it. That would be the only. Um, like advanced thing I'd want to add in there yeah. is that if you start to blend between different rotations, it's a good framework to use. I guess that's a really good point. They, they, a, they're less information. So a matrix has a lot of data in it that comes along for the ride. A quaternion is a lot more lightweight. It's just four little float values to encode a bunch of important information. Uh, and like David said too, they really gracefully blend with each other. You just multiply them together and they just, they just do what they're supposed to do. Would an example for be uh, of that be the combined rotators um, function that exists? Yep. I mean, under the hood, if it's an if it's an F transform in Unreal, which is our big bucket container object, which actually is this interesting <laughs> beast in and of itself, but it has a quaternion in it, and that would be the kind of stuff where under the hood it would evaluate the quaternions, mm -hmm. multiply them together, and then spit out the new one. Yeah, because the only thing you need to think about is uh, the order that you add them, and then it sort of does what you want it to, and sure. you don't really have to think about it that hard. Sure. Um, just sort of get back to how you use it inside. Yep. Um, inside I the think editor. they're fascinating, but I, I have a hard time explaining to them to them to anyone else in a complexity that exceeds what I just did. Next time, we'll <laughs> so have basically, you know, we'll have a pencil and an orange next okay. time. I, yeah. I, I'm happy to <laughs> visualize the analogy in a screenshot form, but yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. Can you recommend any good books or courses on linear algebra? I need to understand the dot product better. Thanks. Oh, what I really love that um, on YouTube that was it three brown three blue three one blue one brown yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great website uh, channel on YouTube is the three blue one brown channel and they've got a nice bit on dot products mm -hmm. and a bit on um, matrix multiplications vectors in general uh, just beautiful visualization so that's something I would I would start with um, yeah. even yeah. a soothing voice it <laughs> has, it has it all yeah <laughs> did, we, did we include the slide no we don't. Okay, yeah. that's maybe something we could follow up with. We had a slide from the Math for Artists class that we did internally that had that and like probably five or six yeah. other recommended readings that we can go after. Could so put them on a forum. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll perhaps we could add them to the slide deck um, and then share that. Yeah, we can definitely do something like uh, that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll add some good references, starting points. <laughs> awesome, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I just for mathematical learning in general, 3 Blue One Brown is awesome, Khan Academy is awesome, and Better Explained is awesome. Mm -hmm. All three of those in very, very different formats and reasonings are successful. Mm -hmm. And it can be good to have several references to find the one that works for you, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Even though you've studied once, maybe you didn't get it, try yeah. to find a different resource. To and work. some of them are yeah. better for one thing than others. Like the three blue, one brown dot product stuff is super awesome. Uh, the, on Better Explained, their simple English explanation of trig was like the greatest trig thing I've ever read. It was so uh, digestible in a way that almost none of them are. So it's like each of these resources has their uh, their great points, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So. That's awesome. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about mouse vector? Um, is there an easy way to understand it? Well, it, it may be that they are talking about screen coordinates. I is think that so. kind okay. of the yeah. reference point? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, we do a lot of work where we would transform something so that it's whatever you, wherever you are in the world is just relative to <laughs> where you are compared to the, un, you know, your view into the world. And there's two ways to think about that. There's like the view transform, which gets you into this kind of like, imagine the, the, the screen is UVs. So it'd be like from corner to corner, zero to one. And that's this kind of like view space. And then if you ever hear somebody refer to something called clip space, it takes that and just shifts it so the zero point is in the middle of the screen. 
And that's important for a bunch of interesting um, rendering reasons. That's how we do our perspective transform. But also that's kind of cool to work in that space because now all of your positions are relative to that center point and you can do, um, so like right now we're dabbling in some lens flares stuff just for fun experimenting and we can do all that work kind of in clip space because you have this relative to the center that you can move things around. So um, that's one of those, those are both transforms that we have, have across, um, you know, the blueprints and materials and so yeah. on is you can transfer from like, let's say world to view and then you'll get that, where, what am I relative to my, the box I'm looking through? Mm -hmm. Or you can transform to clip space and then you're like, what am I relative to the center of my screen? Um, and those are very, very useful transformations where you can do comparisons to your mouse cursor because your mouse cursor naturally is in that relative zero to one space already. And so you could just take a world space position, transform it into that view space to say like, I'm at point one and I'm at po my mouse is at point nine. And now I can do all sorts of like yeah. friendly, again, it's that language translator. Mm -hmm. Now that you're both speaking the same language, you can compare each other and how far away am I and what's my angle from you? Like mm -hmm. all those things kind of fall out of answering that question as long as they're speaking the same language. Yeah, I don't know if there's a if there's one for uh, mouse position and material editor that you can feed it in from like a blueprint or something mm -hmm. as a parameter. Yep. Uh, but a, a lot of things in materials like um, let's say we map things to screen position on the world, but then you want to like add its position and we're, this is effectively just a transform, right? So you maybe align like, um, I do this a lot like holographic like scan lines and it's aligned to the screen, but as the object moves, the scan lines move with it, so it's kind of tracked. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of visual um, use, use cases for something like that. Yeah. Are you using numerical maths in Unreal Engine for, for example, algorithms? Um, I guess I can tell you we, I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to by numerical maths, but we do have a um, math library and several parts of math libraries throughout the engine on the C++ side that we use to do um, a whole host of things. So we have implemented inside of the Unreal Engine, like Wyatt was talking about F-transforms, we have quaternions, we have uh, representations for vectors where you can take dot products between them, get pro cross products, and uh, more sophisticated things for very specialized purposes, different sorts of transforms, um, a little bit of matrix multiplication in there. So we're using uh, numerical methods a lot, and we have different parts of math libraries scattered about the engine to help us with these different tools or these different, um, trying to meet these different applications. Some of it is more on simulation for moving particles around, where you have the velocity of a particle and you need to update its location and have it uh, test the world around it and do that again and again. So the physics engines use a lot of um, numerical methods for their, um, for their simulations. So we're using numerics um, lots and lots of places, rendering, physics, geometry, all sorts of things. Cool, I'd say that answers the <laughs> question <laughs> pretty well. Um, so we talked a little bit about mouse vectors. There was also a couple of questions around sort of distance fields and a little bit more practical um, mm -hmm. sort of how you use it. So I, I'm going to list a couple of the questions, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Um, how where does one use distance fields in Unreal, Unreal Engine? Is that a data type you import? Is it mm -hmm. accessible in materials, in Niagara, et cetera? And then are there any distance field examples in the content examples or elsewhere? I believe there are s examples. I'm pretty sure we have. Um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a cascade collision with distance field example, although I'd have to look. Um, at the very least, that's one of the default options, like in the you know, existing tools in um, uh, Cascade or now Niagara, the new particle sim, um, can collide with the level dis world distance fields. But more broadly, to answer that question, if you go into your project settings and enable mesh distance fields, now it will go through and as a pre-process step, it will calculate based on some metric of how much memory you want to spend and how high resolution you want them to be, it will calculate those distance fields for those meshes. And all of your static meshes will ha have this pre-calculation step done unless the box isn't checked. But like if you place a static mesh in the world, th this calculation will happen. It will build these distance fields around each of your uh, atomic objects, right? And then um, for a performance, what happens is if you want to sample them, uh, it would be a little bit tough to say like, hey, I'm going to look around for the nearest object to me and only sample its distance field and 
Um, it's just a hard problem when, when it is so atomic and you don't have this broader kind of like container of what we call like a global distance field, which is just the sum of all these distance fields that are on individual assets in the scene. So what we do is every frame, we basically take the sum of all of those and we pack them into a lower resolution kind of grid that's aligned to your view. And we're just rebuilding that every frame. And we have functions in Niagara, we have functions in the material editor, functions all over the tool to say, what is my distance from the nearest thing to me? And we can get that answer back by looking up into that big global distance field. And so in the editor, uh, there's a visualized mode. You can just go show distance fields, and it will bring up this hazy, ethereal view of the level, which is basically a visualization of how far is any given point in the world from the nearest thing to it. Uh, and we uh, query that, like in Niagara, we query that distance field for particle collisions, and the particle is just going like, hey, query the field, query the field. Every frame it's asking, how far, you know, am I really close to something? And then it starts to care when it gets really close, and then when it's close enough, it will say, okay, I'm close enough to care. What is the um, gradient of the, you know, surface that I'm colliding with? And so that would basically just be, I take whatever that gradient that would have got me there and flip it, and now that's my little normal, and I do exactly what we showed at the very first example, where I go, oh, I know what that, I know I'm past the surface, because it's a signed distance field. I don't know if you guys remember that, but, you know, if I'm going to go through, that would mean that that value that I'm sampling would become negative. And so on that frame that I would have gone in there, I say, oh, oh boy, I would have gone in. That's not good. So I stop, figure out how far I would have had to travel because I have that gradient. I have the distance. I have all that encoded information right there in the distance field. I move right to the surface, and then I take the remainder of how far I would have gone, and I just flip it back using this reflection technique that we've already showed. So that's kind of a built-in unrealism and there are a lot of things in the material editor too you can do that like per pixel you can ask how far am I from distance field and there's a bunch of cool visualizations people have done of like blobs that start to deform as they get close to mm -hmm. the surface because that blob is saying like oh I'm a vertex I'm getting really close now oh I'm getting too close I don't want to go <laughs> in I want to push away and then the end result of that is the thing goes blorp and squishes into a pancake instead of penetrating the surface and that's kind of comes for free by asking the distance field, how far am I from it? Yeah. And, it and it's gradient. So yeah, that's a built-in unrealism. For those specific things, I generally try to think of it as a wrapping paper that's <laughs> like over everything. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, at least when you think about it in terms of like collision. Right. Um, yeah. And that's useful for fog, too. Uh, if you do like volumetric fog stuff, sampling distance field mm. data is super nice. Like you can say like as it approaches closer to surfaces, to m much like we would expect fog to collect like on the floor or something like that. You can access all that data uh, in the material editor. So there's a lot of powerful usages for so that. So it's a little different from the depth fade then. Uh, it, yeah, it's a similar concept. Like depth mm -hmm. fade is like with translucent materials, it's saying like get behind me what the dif distance is. And you can do things like just get the get the difference and then you can like do dot products to like try to calculate angles and stuff like that. Um, distance fields have like way more data. I don't think we don't support distance fields on translucent stuff, right? Is that like not a thing? It's got to be an opaque geometry. Uh, no, you can query it. You can? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Today I learned then, so <laughs> it's even more powerful than I thought. So, um, But s same concept, uh, way more powerful, though, and okay. robust. Um, and I thought, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like with collision, with distance field collision, like I, I thought it could do it off camera, too. Like scene depth collision is. It, that's the beauty. That's the, the great beauty of the distance field. The only limiter of the distance field is resolution. So we encode these as textures, basically. They're like little volumetric texture, 3D textures that surround all our objects, and they make a coarse approximation of the distance to that surface. If we spent a ton of memory, we would have a really perfect thing where the what David was referring to as the ISO surface, which is that zero point, would be really well conformed to me. But as it stands. If I were a statue, it would probably just say like, "I'm I'm hand shaped," and I would <laughs> bounce off the hand shaped blob, you know, because that's as much resolution as we're going to dedicate to the problem to make it performant and run on modern consoles and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the downside of distance fields is they are inherently an approximation unless you like have a really really high resolution one. The upside is is that it's three dimensional. So with uh, scene depth buffer collision. If I can see it, I can collide with it. But if I had a particle flying toward me and I wanted it to bounce off the back of yeah. something, 
I can't first as a, as the camera. I can't see that, so I just go right through. I die. We just you just lose particles to scene depth collision, and we actually have all these checks in there to be like, oh, I lost you. We should probably kill you. Like we we just kind of manage that for you and try to make it not terrible. With the distance field collision, you have this full beautiful three D representation of the scene, and so part the balls, you know, in my first example would would do exactly the same thing if they were colliding against the distance field. They'd have that, no matter which part of the scene they were bouncing off and colliding against, they would have something to talk yeah. to to ask the question, how far away am I and what is this little normal? They, they would be able to ask that from any direction. So they're, au they're awesome. They're is awesome. that why distance field shadows also are drawn even when they're not in the frustum? Exactly the same. Okay, problem. yeah. Yep. Um, this is good topics. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Good questions, too. A couple more have come in. We have a little bit of time left. I'm sure. feeling there's been quite a lot of information, so let's take the full time and just go through the questions yeah, as well. Sure. Um, we're here. A, a few tidbits. Mm -hmm. um, I think both chats were individually calling you the Bob Ross of math. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, they were all really happy. They would like to, they would like to see um, more episodes of this math for awesome. artist thing. It's really it, fun. Yeah, cool. and it's it's extremely useful, right? Especially getting it in the context of a tool that you might be working with, and so we can relate a little bit more to the mm -hmm. the real world of, yeah. of how you're working with with the math. Yeah. Um, why do you have transform rotators, color, etc., as different classes uh, while it's just vectors? Um, yeah, those. So much the I I can answer that in the context of like for instance Niagara, we do that because we can guide you to behavior. So a, a quaternion is a vector four. It's the same thing. It's just four pieces of information that, if they're encoded in the right way, m result in a rotation around an axis. That's cool. You can just say that's a vector four, four floats, four pieces of information. We, we type it so that if I pull off of a quaternion in that editor, I get a bunch of context-sensitive, useful things that are relevant to my interests when working with quaternions. And if I had a module which took quaternion, it expected quaternions, if I am s encoding a quaternion from some other means, like I have a module which generated one that I know is good, it's like it's normalized and it's rotating. If there's another uh, behavior further down my kind of stack of behaviors that expects a quaternion, I don't want the user to just plug some arbitrary four vector in because you're going to get an undesirable mm -hmm. result. So. Almost all the times that we classify these things, even though they really are all just vectors, we do that to guide the user to healthy, predictable behavior and not for any other purpose. Yeah, there could be potential, I'm sure, like memory saving concerns too about different data types and how much of that data we want to store. Like precision matters. But I think the intuition of the person who's asking the question is totally right. Like we're just establishing numbers, right? Like, why well, can't RGBA drive you know, uh, RPY rotations, you know, things like that, and we can. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, a lot of times, we break information out yeah. and get the individual components and do in, do different things with that. So, um, another one, other uh, tail bit of that too is like uh, context. Uh, going with what Wyatt said is that like you open up the blueprint editor and a vec four versus a linear color is very convenient for me as an artist. Like a, a linear color, if you double click, actually brings up the color picker. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I don't want to yeah. type in <laughs> RGBA. Like sometimes I do, but you know, sometimes you want to be able to just use your eye and start mm -hmm. adjusting value, hue, saturation, value, and stuff. Yeah. So like, you know, some of that is just convenience too from the from the tool from the editor. So yeah, it helps you to understand the concept of data types if you didn't know that when you started working with. Um, oh yeah, with blueprint, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and so it's sort of, help. and especially you know, trying just trying to plug things in, and oh, it's blue <laughs> and that's orange. All right, okay, yeah. maybe they're not. And that's the yeah, thing about orange. blueprints, like it, it lets you like, it does a lot of the casting stuff for you. Like, and if mm -hmm. you were doing this in C plus plus, you have to like break this stuff with a lot of extra steps. Like, you can break apart. If uh, I think this is like a little secret that most people don't know, you can right click on most variables or outputs or inputs and. In, um, in blueprints and actually say split components, I think it's called, or, or like break components, I can't remember. Yeah. And it actually just shows, you know, RGBA right there. And um, I think like split struct, is what it's called? It's not, it's, it's a similar idea. Like, a str yeah. it's like a struct will break apart all the individual components of the structure, but like, this is like I have an XYZ, like a vector, you know, and you right click and it's a split or show components, whatever it's called. Might as well just show it. Um, <laughs> it'll actually turn from yellow, which mm -hmm. is the the color coordination of blueprints for a vector three, 
and it'll actually show three greens, so the individual scalar components. Yeah, so. Instead of using the break, adding another exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's useful, super useful. I do, I use it all the time. Yeah. See, so we got time for a few more. Um, they were wondering if there was, if you might know, if there was a distance field example in the uh, particle examples project. I thought there was a cascade one but it's been a very, very long time since I looked, so I've, we probably shouldn't take that as gospel. I do know that we have not yet written one for Niagara, but that is on our list for uh, the next time we address the Niagara sample content. We want to have elucidate more of the options of individual modules, and instead of just talking about the key concepts behind how Niagara works, we want to be a little bit clearer about how some of the core behaviors work, like how the modules work. So as we go and make example content, we'll make sure that that's on there. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but I will also say, if you're in Niagara and you put in a collision module a in 423 or the 424 preview, one of the drop downs, if you are a GPU sim, one of the drop downs is distance field. And then it just samples the distance field. <laughs> it does, does what it says on the tin. Uh, and so you can, with a couple of clicks, you could tr try it out, basically. All right. Um, they were asking about fun examples for all the things we talked about. Um, don't really have time to go through that, but uh, maybe next time they can More be more fun. I was gonna say, what was wrong with our example? <laughs> <laughs> I think they were uh, relating. <laughs> We've got See, that was slides. the problem. Yeah. We do have stuff from the math class. And yeah. We could pull that up if you guys want. If you I mean, I, I think the reality is, is we're just gonna do more of these. Yeah. At some point, I mean, and there's a, a million topics, and we could we could sit here and just talk about vectors for like four hours, and <laughs> there would useful stuff would just fall out of that the whole time. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Let's do that. Um, I'll grab a few more. Uh, how to smooth um, SDF sign distance fields? It's currently like voxelized grid, kind of blobs in space in Unreal Engine. Uh, well, the, the texture filtering does its best to interpolate between the positions that are encoded in that big texture, but there's only so much you can do. You, you have to increase resolution to get more data. <laughs> At some point, you are sampling a texture um, that we rebuild, or a buffer, I guess. I don't know if we actually encode it or not into a 3D texture, like a volume texture. I asked Daniel. Um, yeah. But at some point, you're having this data which we are interpolating between center points of these cells that we're saving off, and that is going to be lossy and linear in a way that if we had this per beautiful mathematical function would not be. Um, but there are set project settings to increase the resolution. The, the, this grid, this like froxel, they call it grid, is like a uh, pyramid in front of you which we rebuild every frame and we, we uh, make the global distance field out of, you can increase the resolution of that. Because the individual meshes are pretty high resolution, much higher than the global distance field that we right. rebuild every frame. So there's more data sitting there. And so you could, if you had the performance to do so, you could spend more of that by changing some CVARs or some INIs or whatever the project setting is. And so you could spend more of your budget on a higher resolution version of the global mm -hmm. distance field. So it's always a balance between what the scene looks yeah. like and what you're yeah. trying to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm ignorant to a lot of this stuff, but this is the same problem with fluid sims, right? Because you're just obviously solving individual voxels, and then they do a bunch of math to make something really nice looking. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a way. I'm sure it's not cheap <laughs> and, not, and not per friendly to do this every frame and get you know 30 or 60 frames per second. So, mm -hmm. so there is one interesting quality of a distance field. If you just think about a distance field as like a distance from a surface, the farther away you are from the thing that is the the ISO surface, that zero boundary, the more a distance field resembles a, s a sphere or a disk. It, it, it rounds mm -hmm. itself off by the nature of the sampling of it the further away you go from that surface. Um, and so sometimes people will use the trick of they'll sample from further away than they want and then kind of like subtract to get themselves back to where they wanted to sample. And they can sample a rounded version of the distance field yeah, that they distinct. want to ask for. And that's a common trick and technique. And so like if you had a distance field of a square and you march out a little bit, that square looks more like a rounded box. Mm -hmm. And then you subtract how far out you went, and now you have made yourself a rounded box for free. Because you sampled a box distance field at a, at, a, at a point where it looked a little bit more like a, a, a circle. Mm -hmm. And so that's a trick that we use, too, to like round off and contour spiky distance fields. You could actually just ask for the position a little further out and then fudge mm -hmm. it. It's like almost like a detail scaler or something. It like is. Less detail. It's it interesting. Is. I like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I sometimes mix up cross product and dot product. I know one's functionally a normal and the other represents an angle. And they're asking for a trick or a mnemonic to remember which is which. And I wanted to, the community responded with something that I thought was pretty cool oh, that we haven't good. mentioned yet. We already showed the uh, uh, sort of yes. cross, <laughs> yeah, cr uh -huh. cross product. I don't think it was on camera last time oh, we okay. did it. Oh, okay. um, We're all doing the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> finger guns. Throw down. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> community, <laughs> the community response was think uh, think of a dot as a small symbol. The dot product gives you the gives you only one number, so it's small in size. Think of a cross as a larger symbol. The cross product gives you a new vector, so it's larger in size. Yeah, I, like and that. I can see that okay. being a useful, a useful mm -hmm. yeah. mnemonic for sure. I think the, the 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 number one thing to recognize and remember is that the dot gives you a single value from two vectors, and then the cross gives you a new vector, right? Which is actually my hands mm -hmm. don't make sense when I'm doing that, <laughs> but it just gives you a single a single floating value versus a cross gives you like the x, y, and z, right? That's that's the most important mm -hmm. thing. Um, and what you can do with that, there's tons. We can probably do a whole class on that too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we should. I mean, I think that's that's a whole other area which you could mine for a very, very long time. And when we talk about trig at some point, I hope we do. When we start talking about sines and cosines and stuff, all that stuff is all interrelated, and it all falls out of the same place. So that'll be a fun one. Mm -hmm. All right, we're. This has definitely gone on. We're almost up to the two-hour mark already. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, 356. And so any any future questions, we'll have to um, leave for the next stream, I guess. Um, thank you all f so much for coming on and preparing all this amazing content for us. It's our pleasure. That yeah, I fun. really like the uh, interaction between the, the deck and then some content and seeing what it looks like in reality. That definitely helps sort of um, digest the math itself. Sure. Um, so uh, and so so did chat think they were very happy about it. Um, so we'd all love to have you back. That would be awesome. Awesome. Um, next week, we will not have a stream. We are all out for Thanksgiving here in the office, um, the American holiday that we'll be celebrating. Um, but the week after that, uh, we will be um, talking about 424 features. And Ryan Brooks will actually show off uh, some of our new landscape tools. Um, super. That awesome. we have in 424. Yeah, super cool. They I saw look awesome, so enjoy that one. Yeah, no, it's great. We I did see his talk from Unreal Dev Days, and that's actually available online now. If you mm -hmm. if you can't wait, uh, you can go <laughs> ahead and... Spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah, spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah, he, he did show it off, but we'll do it here on the stream as well. Uh, Nick Pamorden will be here as well to talk about sort of general 424 features. Cool. Um, but until then, if you are interested in our meetups that happen around the world, go ahead and go to unrealengine.com slash user dash groups. Um, if you don't find any meetups near you, you can go ahead and reach out to us in case you are wondering, has there been one here before? Was there an organizer that is no longer making any, um, hosting any meetups? And if you're interested in what that might mean and you think there's a community around you that would like this to happen, go ahead and reach out to us at community at unrealengine.com. Um, as always, make sure you visit our forums, uh, the unofficial disc Discord, uh, Unreal Slackers. I, I think, I know why it is on there. I've seen your I um, dance that dance from time to time. Yeah, a little bit. Um, it's a good community. If you need some, you have a quick question and you want some yeah. people to just talk about the subject, um, they are almost up to 29,000 members now, I think. That's awesome. Uh, which is I did not know that. Amazing. And it's all run by the community. We hang out there to you know, answer some questions and whatnot. But yep. um, Nick Fister is a great guy. He's make, making sure all, the, all that's working. Uh, there's a Facebook group. Uh, and then Reddit as well is, is, is very active if you're looking for resources and uh, want to get in contact more with the community around Unreal. Engine. Uh, we're getting low on countdown videos. I would love to see another one being submitted to us. If you're unfamiliar with what they are, it's the first little five minutes of the stream where we, we count down before we go live. Um, it is 30 minutes of development in the editor. Uh, speed that up to five, uh, five minutes and then send that with your logo separately to us and we will composite them together um, to add the countdown. It would be awesome to see them, so I'm going to keep mentioning that until I see more. Um, if you stream on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine category like we do. And uh, make sure you follow us on all our social media accounts, um, Twitter, Facebook. We have a LinkedIn one that is a little bit more tailored towards AIE uh, Enterprise. Um, that's where we pretty much deliver all of our news that come out from what happens here at Epic uh, regarding Unreal Engine. And so until next time that we have all of you on, uh, thank you very much for coming. And to all of you, we will see you in two weeks. Have a good week and a good Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.